Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to be in section 58 and 59 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Section 58 is right after the dedication of the land. The land of Missouri, specifically Jackson County, was designated as the center place. And so the Lord's going to give further instruction concerning this land. Look in verse 1. Hearken, O ye elders of my church, and give ear to my word, and learn of me what I will concerning you, and also concerning this land, unto which I have sent you. And then the Lord talks about tribulation in verse 2 and 3. He even says, You cannot behold with your natural eyes for the present time the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter, and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. And historically... This is what happens, isn't it, Bryce? Much tribulation does come, not only to their lives, but collectively to all of us since then, because the Lord at the end of this story is going to say, my people aren't prepared to build Zion, and they won't be until they suffer and learn obedience. And so he's just foreshadowing some of the tribulation that is coming that will mold us into the people we need to be. Now, last time in our podcast, Mike and I gave you kind of an overall review of what happened in Jackson County, because one of the most important lessons for me that comes out of church history is we have to learn to pick up the baton. We are the last leg of the race, and we have to take the baton that's been given to us, and we have to cross the finish line. We have to learn from the failure of the first attempt to build Zion in Jackson County, and we have to get it right. We cannot build a celestial city if we're not a celestial people. So starting in section 58, the Lord kind of begins to hold the bar up high. So he's going to tell us how to become a celestial people. So as we go, I'm going to kind of make a list of attributes of the type of people that will be able to build Zion. And I think we all need to approach this, even though I wasn't there in 1831. I wasn't there in 1833 when the persecution began. I wasn't in the first group called to establish Zion. But as a temple-endowed member of this church, I have made covenants that I will, in fact, build Zion. And our champion, our captain right now, President Nelson, is clearly marching us towards the gathering of Zion. So all of us need to prepare to be the kind of people that will be worthy to build Zion. So attribute number one of a celestial people is verse two, they are faithful in tribulation. That idea comes up quite often, that we have to be faithful in tribulation. When Joseph Smith was in Liberty Jail, and just a tough situation where Joseph cries out, O God, where art thou, and where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? The Lord tells Joseph, Thine adversities and thine affliction shall be but a small moment, and then, if thou endure it well. So here in section 58, and then again in section 121, when his people are facing tribulation, The Lord says, you need to endure it well. And how do we pass that test? What does it mean to be faithful in tribulation? So very quickly, let me just point out what is suggested by the Book of Mormon in how we are not faithful in tribulation. If you want to join me, I'm in Mosiah chapter 10 in the Book of Mormon, talking about the tradition of the Lamanites which is this. So even though it's Mosiah, we're back to Laman and the tradition of Laman. So Mosiah chapter 10, verse 12, they were a wild and a ferocious and a bloodthirsty people, believing the tradition of their father. So here was Laman's tradition. And then if you'll skim through verses 12 and 13, you'll notice a repeated word. And that is that Laman always felt wronged when tribulation came. And you'll hear Latter-day Saints kind of say things like, I don't deserve this, or why is this happening to me? I, 
they'll question why tribulation is happening in their life, and they feel wronged. They feel like God is doing something that they don't deserve, that this is somehow unfair, that tribulation should be fair. But tribulation will never be fair in this mortal life. And when tribulation comes, Laman always felt wronged. And then if you'll go 14 through 16 and notice another repeated word, back in Mosiah 10 still, 14 through 16, every time Laman felt wronged, he got wroth. They were wroth when they were crossing the sea. They were wroth when they arrived in the promised land. So when you feel wronged, when tribulation comes into your life, quite often we get angry. We get angry at God. We get angry at other people. We get angry at mortality, and we're angry. We feel like tribulation is not fair. And then verse 17, because Laman felt wronged and was wroth, he hated. He taught his children to hate to murder, to rob, to plunder, and to do all that they could to destroy. And some people do that with God. Because they feel wronged and get wroth, they hate God. They turn against Him and they want to hurt Him. A very easy way to hurt God is to break His commandments and go contrary to what you know are His desires for you. The Book of Mormon would suggest that is not being faithful in tribulation. That is not how the Lord would have us respond when tribulation comes. So let's contrast that with Nephi. Now, you could go through the book of First Nephi, and you could make a list of how Nephi responds. I love when he breaks his bow. What does he do, Mike? He breaks his bow, and instead of whining and complaining and getting down and depressed and feeling wronged and getting wroth, he simply does what? Just goes and builds another bow. Just makes another bow. This is a beautiful illustration on how to be faithful in tribulation. Just build another bow and then ask for help on where you should go to hunt. Nephi is the embodiment of being faithful in tribulation, which is the gift of first Nephi, is to watch a young man who needed his heart to be softened eventually become the spiritual giant because he is faithful in tribulation and he receives the promises. But I love the summary that's in the Doctrine and Covenants. I know it's not really given about Nephi, but I certainly apply it to Nephi. If you'll turn to section 136, this is given to Brigham Young at Winter Quarters. Behind us, we have everything that happened in Ohio and Missouri, Joseph's murder, the repeal of the Nauvoo Charter. We have a whole lot of challenges behind us. Ahead of us is the trek west, crickets and Johnston's army and creating a civilization out of the desert. And right there in the middle of all of this, the Lord gives us section 136, verse 31. My people must be tried in all things. That's interesting language from the Lord. My people must be tried in all things. And I think sometimes we have this assumption, because I'm doing what's right, God's going to prosper me. And yet all of this is being tempered and balanced with section 136. Yeah. Mortality, with, in fact. With all the problems they have, like you said, crossing west and all of those things, section 59 is going to talk more about the earth, is going to yield, and, and you're going to prosper, and yet we have these Bad. verses. And so it's kind of like, once again, we have this state of contraries. And religion is this ocean of contraries. And I think that's why it's so easy to pick apart, especially today in the world that we live in, this secularism. Everyone likes to take shots at religion. And I just offer this up as it's proving contraries. Religion, coming under the Savior, is finding a balance between these contraries and prospering in the sense of, I, that's why I like the, the word for prosper as I'm crossing over. I'm spiritually coming to the Lord. I may not necessarily be the most prosperous financially, but I can go through this mor mortal existence, like you mentioned, it's mortality, and I can have peace. It's that verse that where Jesus says, peace I give unto you, but I'm not giving you the peace that the world gives. My peace I give unto you. Yeah. 
That's brilliantly stated. And you can see why so many people, even Latter-day Saints, good Latter-day Saints, feel wronged. Because we have this expectation that if I'm righteous, God blesses me and I prosper. Well, then when tribulation comes, we feel wronged and we get wroth and we turn against God. So I love this in section 136. My people must be tried in all things that they may be prepared to receive the glory that I have for them, even the glory of Zion. And he that will not bear chastisement is not worthy of my kingdom. So look at those three statements. From section 58, we have this need to be faithful in tribulation. From section 121 to Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail, he says, if you endure it well. And now in 136, he kind of says, if you don't bear chastisement, you're not worthy of my kingdom. So what would follow then is how to bear chastisement. The Lord's not going to say, he that will not bear chastisement is not worthy of my kingdom without pointing out how to bear chastisement. So in the next two verses, he seems to be waving his arm saying, here is how celestial people respond to trial. So verse 32, let him that is ignorant. Now, we can be ignorant for many reasons, but I think in this setting, One of the main reasons I've been ignorant in trial is because I don't know why it's happening to me. I don't know why a loving God would allow this challenge into my life. Someone I loved passed away or a disease I never dreamed of dealing with. Let him that is ignorant. So if you don't understand, humble yourself by calling upon God. In other words, tribulation should cause me to run towards him, not away from him. Celestial people who don't understand why they are being called upon to suffer, run towards him. Now, if that happens, your eyes will be opened and you will see and your ears will be opened and you will hear. Why? Because if you call upon God, you will get the Spirit. Verse 33, my spirit is sent forth into the world to enlighten the humble and the contrite to the condemnation of the ungodly, which is a fascinating concept. Sometimes our eyes are only opened in the darkness. There are certain things we only see. Read that verse 32 carefully. Your eyes may be opened only because you are calling upon him in great tribulation. And the only way you are faithful in tribulation or you endure well or you bear chastisement is if you run towards God and your eyes get opened and you begin to see. That is a very hard reality of discipleship tribulation in its many forms is going to come. And if we run towards him and seek his hand and seek his understanding, our eyes will be open. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll always understand why the tribulation came. I can say that from personal experience. But there are lessons I have learned only in tribulation. Let me give you a couple of examples. The Martin Handcart Company suffered tremendously in the snow. And years later, one of them was in Cedar City, Utah, listening to some criticism of the Martin Handcart Company leaders. And he stood up and rebuked them. But his rebuke is so eye opening. He stands up and says, I ask you to stop this criticism. His name is uh, Francis Webster. You may have heard this quotation. We'll put it in the show notes. But Francis Webster stands up and says, I ask you to stop this criticism. You are discussing a matter that you know nothing about. Cold historic facts mean nothing here, for they give no proper interpretation of the questions involved. Mistake to send the handcart company out so late in the season? Yes. But I was in that company. We suffered beyond anything you can imagine, and many of us died of exposure and starvation. But did you ever hear a survivor of that company utter a word of criticism? No one of that company ever apostatized or left the church because every one of us came through with the absolute knowledge that God lives, for we became acquainted with him in our extremities. I have pulled a handcart when I was so weak and weary from illness and lack of food that I could hardly put one foot ahead of another. 
I have looked ahead and seen a patch of sand or a hill slope, and I said I can only go that far, and there I must give up, for I cannot pull the load through it. I have gone on to that sand, and when I reached it, the cart began pushing me. I looked back many times to see who was pushing my cart, but my eyes saw no one. I knew that the angels of God were there. Was I sorry that I chose to come by handcart? No, neither then nor any minute of my life since. The price we paid to become acquainted with God was a privilege to pay. And I am thankful that I was privileged to come in the Martin Handcart Company. Now, that's something you can only say after tribulation, when your eyes have been opened. That you became acquainted with God in tribulation. I know a lot of people who are suffering tremendous challenges in their life, and tribulation comes in many forms. But may we be a celestial people. May we be faithful in tribulation. May we understand verse 3. Going back now to sections 58. You cannot behold with your natural eyes for the present time the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. For after much tribulation come the blessings. Wherefore the day cometh that you shall be crowned with much glory. The hour is not yet, but is nigh at hand. We worship a God of three scoops of ice cream. When I took my oldest child to be immunized, I couldn't bear the thought of causing my only child the kind of pain that I knew shots would bring her. Three shots. I'll never forget the look she gave me. That look said, Daddy, why are you doing this to me? I thought you loved me. And I wonder how many times I give that look to God. I thought you loved me. I thought you cared about me. Why are you doing this to me? Now, there's things I just could not have really explained to her. I really couldn't have explained to a two-year-old how immunization works. But she needed those shots. Now, that doesn't change the fact that as soon as we left the doctor's office, can you guess where we went? Where do you think I took that two-year-old little girl? I took her to the ice cream store. And she had three shots, so she got three scoops. And I'll never forget the look on her face when I turned around from the counter and had three scoops of ice cream for her. Now, what do you think she's going to remember from that day? The shots or the ice cream? It is my testimony that God is a God of three scoops of ice cream. And he has to immunize us. He has to, we have to bear chastisement for whatever reasons he has. But when the trial is over, it is my testimony that he takes us out for three scoops of ice cream. He is that kind of God. But let's be clear. My people must be tried in all things that they may be prepared for the glory, which is prepared for them. Tribulation is coming in all of our individual lives. And if we are faithful in tribulation, the reward of those who are is greater in the kingdom of heaven. Let's go on. In verses 6 through oh, 14, he says, here's why I sent you out here. Here's kind of what you're supposed to be doing if you're a celestial people and you're trying to build Zion, the Lord says, I have called all of you, even in 2021, I have called upon you to build Zion that. Here's what needs to come out of our efforts to build Zion. I sent you out here, verse 6, to be obedient. So one of the main things I need to do in my quest to build Zion and to gather Israel is to be obedient. Next is another that in verse 2, I sent you out here that your hearts might be prepared to bear testimony of the things which are to come. I think what he's saying is celestial people bear witness of the goodness of God even when trial and challenge comes. 
celestial people see. Their eyes are opened. And one of the things they see clearly is God himself. Francis Webster saw God more clearly in his trial. And they, he's, he's not afraid to stand up and bear testimony of the things which he has come to know. Be obedient and be prepared to bear testimony of the things that are coming. Verse 7, another that, I sent you out here that you might be honored in laying the foundation and in bearing record of the land upon which the Zion of God shall stand. Of all the saints of all ages, we are the ones sent to this dispensation to build Zion. We are the ones that every other saint has hoped for because we would succeed. Our dispensation will succeed. I think we need to understand who we are and that it is an honor to live in these days and to lay the foundation of Zion, to gather Israel. It is an honor that we have that so many Latter-day Saints just didn't have the opportunity to do in their day. And I think the Lord is saying, I sent you out here to know that it is a privilege to build Zion. Verse 8 has another that. I sent you out to Zion that we are to prepare a feast. It is the work of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to prepare a feast. Now, that's multifaceted. That's literal. That's symbolic. That's today. That's in the future. It applies to all of those. Anyone who is struggling, anyone who is in pain, anyone who needs his help, my job is to help them find rest and comfort for their souls. I am to help prepare a feast. Verse 9, a supper in the house of the Lord. That's what we should be doing. That's why we go to church and we teach our classes. Those of you who have a teaching assignment, you are to prepare a supper in the house of the Lord and invite the whole world to come and be fed. Now, he says, first, the rich and the learned, but they're not going to come. So then the poor and the lame and the blind and the deaf Prepare a feast for the world. We should offer in our Sunday school classes, in our sacrament talks, in our institute classes, everywhere we go, in seminary, every person who builds Zion should be helping to contribute to that feast that the world is invited to come to. I think it's also a beginning like the beginning of a nation. For example, in the United States, we have this feast in the fall called Thanksgiving. And it's kind of paralleling off the the stuff going on in antiquity when they would bring the harvest in and they would have a feast and they would thank God for their blessings and the king would be inaugurated. This feast was paying honor to God, but it was also acknowledging the king as the king. And today we've secularized it, of course, but we still have this feast on Thanksgiving. And in some families, they actually talk about what they're grateful for. Uh, This is a precursor, or this is foreshadowing the feast that we'll have when the Savior is inaugurated as king. And we'll talk more about this idea when we get to section 59 in this podcast, because this has direct parallels to the 25th chapter of Isaiah. You'll see a bunch of speech in this section that talks about the feast and talks about the earth and Zion, and it's directly connected to this. And so I'm with you. I see this as a feast in the sense of we need to make sure that we feed the saints, right? We take care of the sheep, but it's also a literal feast. And it's also talked about in section 27. And Bryce, I think we practice this every Sunday. We ritually do it with a small piece of bread practicing the feast every Sunday. Yeah. That's the idea. And that's what's beautiful. It's This is symbolic. It's literal. It's today. It's in the future. All of those things. We will someday have a feast like no other feast earth has ever had when Jesus comes and we begin the millennial day. That's the marriage of the Lamb mentioned in verse 11. And I love that all nations are invited. And in everyone's invited. But I also love the practical side of that is every single day I teach my Sunday school class or my primary group or whatever it is, I am supposed to contribute to that feast 
So some wonderful things that kind of create this expectation of what is a celestial people. So in this section, Bryce and I are going to talk about some of the people that are reprimanded. So if you look at verse 14, it talks about Edward Partridge. And I want to jump in before he does that. I, we've got to see ourselves in each of these people. I think we need to take it in the spirit of Moroni 9.31, when Moroni says, Condemn me not for mine imperfections, neither my father. Rather give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest our imperfections, that you may learn to be more wise. So as we talk about the rebukes the Lord gives, we should read these as, oh, okay, he's trying to lift all of us up and be sol- so the more more we can understand what causes a rebuke from the Lord, the more we can avoid that behavior and be a celestial people. So why was Edward Partridge rebuked from God? A lot of it had to do with just his expectation. So when Edward Partridge came to Missouri, and I think everybody probably had this expectation of we're going to build Zion in this perfect place and everything's going to be awesome. And when he got there, he kind of looked at the land and he looked at some of the settlers there and he kind of had a low opinion of the land. And so he was, he was rebuked as the saints prepared to purchase the land. Bishop Partridge and Joseph Smith got into a little bit of argument about the quality of the land. And Edward felt that different parcels of land should be purchased. He disagreed with Joseph on some of the specifics. And in the historical record, Edward's heart was softened, and we moved forward, and everything was made right. But there was some disagreement between these two. And it wasn't just Edward. Other people had expectations of Zion that were not met. And so another example is Sidney Rigdon. Sidney Rigdon had been given the command to write a description of the land. Verse 50 says, I give unto my servant Sidney Rigdon a commandment that he shall write a description of the land of Zion. Now, Sidney's not reprimanded in this section. But if you go to section 63 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord kind of reprimands Sidney. So this is verse 55. Behold, verily I say unto you, I, the Lord, am not pleased with my servant Sidney Rigdon. He exalted himself in his heart and receive not counsel, but grieve the Spirit. Wherefore, his writing is not acceptable unto the Lord, and he shall make another. Now, he does. He does a a good job of describing the land of Missouri later, but in his initial impression of the land, he wrote a description that was not pleasing to the Lord. And so in this section, we see humanity. We see people having expectations, and they weren't met, and the Lord kind of reprimands them. Now, I remember on my mission when I taught a fellow and he came to church. And after he came to church, my companion and I had a conversation with him and his response to us was, frankly, elders, it wasn't what I expected. And we said, well, what did you expect? And he expected something from his faith tradition. He came from a faith tradition that was not ours. And that's what he was expecting because that's what he knew. And I think sometimes that's kind of the nature of things. And we do that so many times. The Jews did that with Jesus. He's not the Messiah we expected. Therefore, they rejected him and ended up crucifying him. They turned away because he, he didn't fulfill their expectations. I wonder how many people that were there on his triumphal entry, shouting and cheering his coming to Jerusalem, were also there before Pontius Pilate asking for his crucifixion because he didn't do any of the miracles I'm sure they expected him to do when he came to Jerusalem. And that is such a common theme, that Jesus is not what I expected, that he's not answering my prayers the way I expected, or that his church is not the way I expected. Just like this land, they expected this incredible land that was worthy of Zion, and what they got was normal, ordinary stuff that needed to be turned into worthy material. In fact, there's a really good description of the land that we put into the show notes And I just want to read part of the description because I found this very interesting talking about what the land looked like. And there's a bunch of good stuff in the very first few paragraphs talking about that as far as they can see, beautiful rolling prairies spread out like a sea of meadows. And then it says things like nothing could be more fruitful 
the forests are a mixture of oak and hickory and black walnut. And you can read all the different types of trees that are in Missouri. And then they talk about the soil. And and I've never been to Missouri, so I can't speak to this, but it talks about three to 10 feet thick soil. And I can't even imagine that. But it, it talks about how wonderful it is and talks about the season being mild and delightful. And then it says nearly three quarters of the year. And I think they're skipping summer because I've heard it gets pretty hot there. But then my favorite part of the description they talk about the disadvantages of the land, and I find this very interesting. The disadvantages here, as in all new countries, are self-evident. They are the lack of mills and schools, together with the natural privations and inconveniences which the hand of industry, the refinement of society, and the polish of science overcome. So note that in the description of this beautiful land with the soils great, the trees are wonderful, There's a couple of things lacking, and once again, they are privations that can be overcome with industry, a refined society, and the polish of science. And the way I read that, Bryce, is the Lord has set the table, but it's not done. We have to do our part. Yep, and we have to have realistic expectations. This is why the children of Israel wander for 40 years in the wilderness. As soon as they get up to the land of Zion, Moses sends 12 spies in to look at the land. And two of the spies, well, 10 of the spies come out and say, oh my goodness, it's an incredible land. There's all these wonderful things, but we'll never conquer it because there's giants and they're going to slaughter us. In spite of all the help the Lord has given them, we're not going to do it. Only two spies come back and say, with the Lord's help, we can do it. And I think one of the lessons we've got to learn is that we have to see with the perspective of eternity. We have to see that The barley bread in front of us may not fill our souls, but with Jesus' touch, it can turn into a feast that will give us more than we can possibly consume. They expected to see God in the land, but the reality is it wasn't there yet. And we all make that same mistake. When Jesus isn't the Messiah we hope he is, or he doesn't answer our prayers the way we thought he would do, or the church is imperfect and mortal because it's filled with mortal beings. What are you going to do when the land is plain and ordinary? Even the timing. I think their expectations were, it's going to be now. And if you look in verse 3, the Lord says, "Mm -mm, not, not until you get much tribulation. And so their question is, when? And the Lord says, soon but after much tribulation. He even tells them that in verse 44, the time has not yet come for many years for them to receive their inheritance in this land, except they desire it through the prayer of faith. It's not going to happen anytime soon, guys. What are you going to do when your expectations are not fulfilled? And I know we didn't talk about this last time, but I think this is worth noting. And that is the two parts of Zion. I think that this is important. So if you go to Ether 13, and it's also in the book of Revelation chapter 21, but in Ether 13 verse 3, it says that it was the place of the new Jerusalem, which should come down out of heaven and the holy sanctuary of the Lord. But then we also have verse 4, that there'll be a new Jerusalem built upon this land. And we see the same thing in Revelation 21, verse 3, where we get this notion that there is a new Jerusalem that's in heaven that's going to come down, but there's also a holy city that will will be built on the earth. And so it's kind of this joining. And and if, if you remember, it's been a while, but if you go back and read some of the stuff in the book of Revelation, it actually talks about this symbol or this image of this cube. And I like to liken that cube unto the Holy of Holies, this idea of holiness coming down combination of things from heaven and things from the earth. Now, I don't know certainly how Ether 13.3 is going to be fulfilled. I don't even know how Zion itself is going to be built or when or how it will be fulfilled, but I have faith that it will be. And that when we look back through the rear view mirror of our lives, as we look back through time, things will make more sense. And it's kind of like that element Bryce was talking about with tribulation. For me, my eyes really don't see it until years later. And even then, I'm with Bryce on this one. There's, time, there's stuff that's happened in my life where I look back and go, I still don't understand it. But if we keep coming to the Lord and we have the eye of faith, I do believe that one day things will make sense. That's my hope. 
So what we can focus on is what kind of people we need to be to make all this happen. What can we do? What can I do today? And so let's continue our list. And I really add that to the list is when we see ordinary land, we need to see it with an eye of faith and see what God can make of it, not what it currently is. So that was kind of the rebuke to Edward Partridge and Sidney Rigdon when they get to Zion. Let me add to another one on our list. Starting in verses 25 through 29 of section 58, we can't be the kind of people that have to be told everything that we need to do. Now, over the next several sections, that's going to be a major issue. And in our lives, we find that sometimes the Lord tells us exactly what to do. Like the brother of Jared, we'll use this analogy of Lot. When the problem was with the air and that was life-threatening, the Lord told them exactly what to do. And we'll see that several times in the Doctrine and Covenants. Other times when the brother of Jared comes up with the light problem, and the expectation is, you're going to tell me exactly how to solve this problem, and the Lord says to the brother of Jared, what do you want me to do to help you? Quite often, the Lord does come down and tell us specifically what we need to do. But also in our life, the Lord expects us of our own free will to be doing the things that would please him anyway. So in verse 26, he says, It is not meet that I should command in all things. For he that is compelled in all things, the same as a slothful and not a wise servant. Therefore, he receiveth no reward. Now, yes, we need to be obedient, and when the Lord tells us to do something, we should do it. But now he's saying we shouldn't only do it when he tells us. We should be anxiously engaged in doing good. We shouldn't be the kind of people that have to be told. Going back to the Jaredites, do you remember? So they go through this wilderness where the Lord is telling them exactly what to do, and then they get to the beach, and they sit there for four years And the Lord isn't pleased that they sat there for four years. They should have been more anxiously engaged and not waited to be told what to do. Quite often you find this among return missionaries who've been hand-fed so much what they need to do on a day-to-day basis. Talk to that person, go down this street, knock on that door, and then they get home and that need isn't there anymore. And they just kind of freeze and they assume that they've lost spirituality because the Lord isn't directing them like he did on the mission. Well, now is the time to build your own barge and get off that beach. Be anxiously engaged and do many things of your own free will. Verse 27, men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of their own free will and bring to pass much righteousness. Don't need to be told Just get to work. How can you contribute? How could you bless someone's life? What good could you do today? Do it. Don't wait to be told to do it. For the power is in them, wherein they are agents unto themselves, and inasmuch as men do good, they will in no wise lose their reward. But he that doeth not anything until he is commanded, and receiveth the commandment with a doubtful heart, and keepeth it with slothfulness, the same is damned. That's not the kind of people who are going to build a celestial city. I remember Elder Oaks talking about this. Some people think that the goal is to have the ability to be free. But he says, no, the goal of agency isn't to be free. The goal of agency is to make the right choice. Yeah. That increases freedom. Anyway, just a thought along the lines of what we're talking about. Yeah, and I love this from Heber J. Grant. President Grant said, Never be found among the number that try to see how little they can do, but always be found among the number that try to see how much they can do. I think the idea there is the people of Zion are just actively doing good. They don't need to be told. They just go out and do good. That's the kind of people that please the Lord. And if you make a mistake, you fix it, and then you readjust. But just be anxiously. I love how he says, inasmuch as they do good, they shall in no wise lose their reward. Sometimes we make a mistake, but the Lord knows that we were trying to do good. So I would add that to the list of being a celestial people. So 
Bryce, right in this stuff with being anxiously engaged, there's another group of people that are being reprimanded in 29 through 33. And we don't know who they are, but it says in 29, he that doeth not anything until he's commanded, and then he receives it with a doubtful heart, you know, he'll be frustrated. And then look what it says in verse 32. I command and men obey not, I revoke and they receive not the blessing. And then they say in their hearts, well, this isn't the work of the Lord, for his promises are not fulfilled. But woe unto such, for their reward lurketh beneath and not from above. Now, historically, there were individuals in the Missouri period that struggled, and they said th these very things. And so in the show notes, we include a quote by John Coral. And John Coral was right there with the saints, and he was with them every step of the way until the Mormon War in 1838. And... He said, nothing convinces me that God has been our leader, for no deliverance came. He just wanted deliverance, and it didn't happen. And so in 1838, he left. And so these verses are at least prophetic to his circumstance. Now, section 58, verse 57, let my servant Sidney Rigdon consecrate and dedicate this land and the spot for the temple unto the Lord. One of the historical contexts of this section and section 59 is that they dedicated a spot to build the temple, a temple which never gets built. And so because it wasn't built, that really was one of the contributing factors to the, the saints not being able to fulfill the promises that were in this section. And so there's a lot going on in 29 through 33. And I like to read those verses using John Coral as one of those historical references as a frame to see them. But these verses apply to us today. We wait to be commanded and we wait to be told, or we wait, we just think, well, I'm just not feeling the spirit or I'm not having these experiences. And I think verses 29 through 33, at least the way I read them, is an invitation to me to be proactive. In other words, I think it's like the Lord saying to me, if you want to have light, you have to do the things that invite the light. And if you do, you will. But if you don't, it's almost like the Lord is saying to me, Mike, don't blame me. You need to do your part. And so I think these verses are as relevant today as they were in 1831. And then after that, the Lord rebukes Martin Harris, and he says some interesting things that often interfere with us building Zion. Martin Harris needed to, verse 39, repent of his sins, for he seeketh the praise of the world. And then W.W. W. Phelps is rebuked, verse 41, because he needs to repent. The Lord is not pleased with him because he seeketh to excel and is not sufficiently meek before me. So again, on this list of how to become the kind of people that will build Zion, one of the enemies is when we begin to seek the praise of the world, when we seek to excel and are not sufficiently meek. The Lord says to the Jews in John chapter 5, verse 44, about what gets in the way as we're trying to build Zion. Do you have verse 44? Read that, Mike. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? So one of the big obstacles is trying to please the world and be recognized by the world. The Lord's going to say that to Joseph in Liberty Jail, when he says the great lesson the church hasn't learned is that the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven. And one of the reasons we don't learn that lesson is because our hearts are set so much upon the things of the world and we aspire to the honors of men. So one of the obstacles to building Zion is seeking to excel praise of the world. It's just Jesus saying, how can ye believe which seek honor one of another? and not seek the honor of God. So here's another one on the list. Verse 42, I really want to pause and shout this one from the rooftops because, man, do we beat ourselves up over past mistakes and past sins. And sometimes we beat each other up. And the Lord is simply saying, look, if you repent, they're gone. Martin Harris and Willard W.W. W. Phelps needed to repent. And if they do, they're gone. Verse 42, he who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. That's how it works with God. He doesn't pull them into his active memory and remind you about them constantly. 
but we do that to ourselves all the time. Part of building Zion is to grant to ourselves and to others a do-over, to say, I made a mistake, and now I get a do-over, and God is going to remember my sins no more. So why am I remembering them? Why am I constantly beating myself up because I was imperfect in the past, rather than recognizing that I learned a lesson and I've changed? I, the Lord, remember them no more, which is trying to say to each one of us, if you have repented of your sins, why do you keep remembering them over and over again? Why do you remind your spouse of past indiscretions? If God has chosen to not remember them, you need to not remember them. I think that's vital that we put that on this list as we build Zion, that people are allowed a do-over and that repentance and forgiveness are essential. It fascinates me that on the list of nine principles that make families successful in the proclamation on the family, items number three and four are repentance and forgiveness. Families don't work unless there is repentance and forgiveness. And the standard is set by the Lord. If you have repented, you are forgiven, and the Lord remembers them no more. Now, how do you know if you've repented? Verse 43, you've changed. You'll confess them. You'll forsake them. You've learned the lesson, and you choose not to recommit those sins again. But I really want to add that to the list because I've watched a whole lot of good people beat themselves up so mercilessly over past mistakes rather than allowing themselves to move on. All right, one more from section 58, and then we'll move to section 59, verses 55 and 56. Let these things be done in order. Verse 56, let the work of the gathering be not in haste, nor by flight. In other words, wisdom and order. We can't run faster than we have strength. You don't need to sacrifice one good thing in your zeal to do another good thing. We need to do all them with wisdom and order. My wife and I did not attend the temple in our in the early years of our marriage when we had small children like we can today. That was just wisdom and order. There was a time and a place, and raising children takes a lot of time and attention. So build Zion in wisdom and order. In historical hindsight, we see the Lord carefully cautioning them, but sometimes in their zealousness to try to do what they think is right, their vision certainly isn't the Lord. And one historian noted, the saints themselves may not have been totally without blame in the matter. The feelings of the Missourians, even though they were misplaced, were undoubtedly intensified by the rhetoric of the gathering itself. They were quick to listen to the boasting of a few overly zealous saints who loudly declared a divine right to the land. As enthusiastic millennialists, they also proclaimed that the time of the Gentiles was short, and they were perhaps too quick to quote the revelation that said, that the Lord willeth that the disciples and the children of men should open their hearts, even to purchase this whole region of country as soon as time will permit. That's the 52nd verse of section 58. Though the saints were specifically and repeatedly commanded to be peaceful and never to shed blood, some seemed unwisely to threaten warfare if they could not fulfill the commandment peacefully. In July 1833, Church leaders reemphasized the importance of legally purchasing the land, but by then a combination of factors was leading to confrontation. That's James Allen and Glenn Leonard in the story of the Latter-day Saints. And I see that totally. I see that the saints were really excited. They're going to come build Zion. The Lord's going to come. And yet we have section 58, which warns them to be wise and to do this with wisdom and order. Oh, and by the way, there's going to be much tribulation. Verse 56, don't be in too big of a rush. We're not doing this in haste. We're not doing it by flight. Oh, and by the way, you're laying the foundation. But sometimes their vision isn't the Lord. Now, the last person that's going to be reprimanded in this section is verse 60, Ziba Peterson. 
And it says, let that which has been bestowed upon Ziba be taken from him and let him stand as a member in the church and labor with his own hands with the brethren until he is sufficiently chastened for all his sins, for he confesseth them not, and he thinketh to hide them. Now, right after this revelation is given, Ziba Peterson marries a gal, and there's speculation as to that, that something may have been improper, but we don't have any historical evidence on either side of this. But after he gets married, he kind of falls away from the church gradually. He moves to a place called Lafayette, and the woman that he marries, is her name is Rebecca Hooper. She's a convert, and eventually the two of them, Ziba and Rebecca, will have eight children. He'll eventually move to California to a place called Hangtown during his time, and he actually became the sheriff of Hangtown, Ziba Peterson. And so he starts out as a missionary, super faithful. He's reprimanded here. He gets married to Rebecca, and he has a family, and he leaves the church. And there's just a lot of gaps of things that we don't have. But he's kind of this last person that in this revelation is reprimanded. And so we have all kinds in this section, don't we? We have Edward Partridge, and he repents and stays faithful. We have Ziba, who leaves. We have W.W. Phelps. He goes through some interesting times where he struggles, but he comes back. And we have Martin Harris. And that leads us to section 59, kind of a continuation. We're back in Zion. It's the Sabbath day this day. It's Sunday. And the Lord gets more specific as to what he expects us to do. A celestial people are a Sabbath grateful people. Jumping right into verse 3, Blessed are they whose feet stand upon the land of Zion who have obtained my voice. For they shall receive for their reward the good things of the earth. Now that's kind of the setting here. Now remember, they're looking at land, and if you don't see with an eye of faith, you don't see the goodness of the land of Zion. And the Lord says, if you are faithful, I will give you of the good things of the land. You will be crowned with blessings from above and with commandments, not a few. That's an interesting concept, that the reward for obedience is to have more commandments to obey. Because a lot of people would see that as, wait a minute, I'm obeying, and now you're giving me more restrictions. But the celestial people, the people of Zion, see that as, give me more instructions. How do I obey more? Because I want to grow. You see that grace for grace coming out in them. Now that I'm making some progress, I want more instruction so that I can make more progress. So the Lord says, I'll bless you with, uh, with more commandments. Then he kind of shifts into the, here are the basic commandments of Zion. Verse 5, he repeats the two great commandments that the Savior summarized. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy might, mind, and strength. And the second one is, verse 6, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now that would include things like, verse 6, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, nor kill, nor do anything like unto it. And those kind of flow out of section 42, where we talked about the modern-day commandments. But now, verse 7, he adds a big one. Thou shalt thank the Lord thy God in all things. Perhaps one of the greatest attributes of a celestial people is that they thank God in all things. In verse 21, he kind of turns that negative. In nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things and obey not his commandment. Kind of has an Old Testament flavor there it in does. verse 21. But this idea of being a grateful people, that we are grateful for everything that we receive. In the middle of section 59, which is so much about the good things of the earth being given to us, the heart and soul is that we are grateful for all that we receive. That then leads him to the next chief one that he wants to talk about, and that is the Sabbath day. Verse 8, Thou shalt offer a sacrifice unto the Lord in righteousness, even that of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Thou shalt offer a sacrifice. Now, specifically... 
we're supposed to do it in the house of the Lord. We're supposed to do it on Sunday. So starting in verse 9, that you may more fully keep thyself unspotted from the world, go to the house of prayer and offer up that sacrament upon my holy day. So thou shalt sacrifice unto the Lord, and then he specifically says, on that holy day, go to the house of prayer and offer up that sacrament. And if you do that, everything else in this section are the blessings he's going to pour out upon you. Here's what's going to happen. He repeats the if in verse 12. It's the same idea, but remember that on this, the Lord's day, thou shalt offer thine oblations and thy sacraments unto the Most High, confessing thy sins unto thy brethren and before the Lord. So if we offer our sacraments, our oblations, if we offer ourselves to the Lord on the Sabbath day, there's a huge long list of blessings that will come to us. If you do that, then, verse 9, you'll remain unspotted from the world. If you do that, verse 16, the fullness of the earth is yours. It kind of has Garden of Eden imagery where we read about the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and the things climbing the trees and walking upon the earth. And then we get verse 17 with the herbs and the barns and the gardens and the orchards and the vineyards. This is very much like Old Testament stuff. If you honor me, I will honor you. And I will let you rest, verse 10. But then verse 23, you'll have peace and eternal life. And that's really an ancient concept. One of the things that made the gods gods in antiquity was that they rested. And so by man resting, he's partaking in what it's like to be like the gods. And all the ancient cultures were doing this. They talked about that the gods rested, but men, their job was to work. And so here God's inviting us to feel what it's like to be with him. So verse 16, the fullness of the earth is yours. And then we're going to have things to please the eye, verse 18, and gladden the heart. And then look at verse 19 food and raiment for the body and for the soul. Now, I'm going to tie this into the stuff that we did with when we did the Sermon on the Mount, where the Lord said to the apostles, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear, because I will clothe you, I will feed you. And that's consecration language. That's liturgically, they're in the temple. This is a, the the whole Sermon on the Mount is the temple text. And so essentially what he's saying to them is, If you do this and you consecrate, then I will give you this. And so that's what section 59 is saying. Now, I can't read section 59 without reading Isaiah. Go to Isaiah 25. The 25th chapter of Isaiah is talking about this. And and by the way, before I even read Isaiah 25, look at the language that section 59 is talking about cheerful countenances, the feast. Specifically, if you go actually go to 58, look at the verbiage used here. I think 58 and 59 do go together. If you look at 58, 8, it says, A feast of fat things might be prepared for the poor, a feast of fat things of wine on the lees well refined. And then we get to this supper imagery in verse 9 where everybody's invited. Okay, with that in mind, and the, and the idea of the, the food and the raiment and everything of the earth in section 59, with those two images in your mind, look at verse 5 of Isaiah 25. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees well refined. And then, verse 7, He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over the nations. He will swallow up death in victory. The context to section 59 was right after Polly Knight dies. When she dies and she's buried, It's at that time where Joseph says, she's a saint, she's the first one to die in Zion, and then he gets this revelation. And Isaiah 25 is tied to the victory over death. 
So we have this connection with this feasting, but we're also wiping away the tears from everybody's faces. This is Isaiah 25, 8. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth, and the Lord has spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, lo, he is our God, we have waited, and he will save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And then there's more in verse 10, trotting down the enemies and so forth. Uh, but if you go back to these verses in Isaiah 25 about the feast of fat things and a feast of wine on the lees, I want to talk a little bit just about verse 6. And I put this in the show notes because it just makes more sense if you can see it on a board. But the King James translators, bless their hearts, they're translating this, and they give us the best stuff that they can I'm just going to go to the Greek text. The Greek text of Isaiah 25 was put together somewhere around 300 BC, way before Jesus. And they're more connected to the things of antiquity than the King James translators are, in my opinion. And in this revelation, in this verse of Isaiah 25, 6, it uses these two words, Christontai Muron. And that essentially is the future Christontai is they will be anointed. And Muron is where we get the word mer. That is the word for the holy anointing oil. So literally what this is a promise of is those that have waited for Jehovah that are at this feast, that they will be anointed. So here's my translation of verse six. The Lord of Sabbath will create for all nations who come to Zion upon this mountain, Mount Zion or the temple, a feast that they will drink joyfully, they will drink wine, and they will be anointed with the holy anointing oil. In other words, what I'm trying to connect is that every time we take the sacrament and we honor the Sabbath day, if we read section 58 and section 59, and we read them through the lens of Isaiah, and they're all connected, they're using the same kind of images, what we see is when we go to church on Sunday and we practice this feast, We are practicing something that we will participate in when we are brought into his presence and we are anointed by him. And then I love verse eight. I look forward to that day where he swallows up death in victory and wipes away the tears from our eyes. That's a very intimate image of of the savior. He's not, he's not some far off deity that's up at the pulpit or up in the clouds and, and shouting at us. This is someone who knows you and who loves you. And I see this in verse 8 and 9 to me. It's like an embrace. Like we've waited for him and he will save us. Bryce, I love that movie, The Testaments, at the end when the young man says to his dad, heal him. He's like, you've waited your whole life, right? Yep. That's what I see here yep. in, the, in the imagery of section 58 and 59 in Isaiah 25. Yep. And then the Savior appears and you just feel yeah. that whole life of service was worth this moment. It's right there. That feasting, that joy, you know, that concept is so frequently repeated in the scriptures. You remember the woman at the well, Jesus says, look, if you feast of this water, if you pursue a worldly life, if you live for the things of this world, you will thirst again. But if you come unto me, if you come to my water, you will drink water that will quench that thirst. The gospel quenches a thirst that nothing else can quench. Joy is something only those who pursue God and his keep his commandments will know. Pleasure the world will know. Recreation the world will know. Maybe even happiness the world will know. But joy that comes from God, this feast that we're talking about, is reserved for those who make it, who keep his commandments. It's all over the scriptures. I just wanted to read Alma chapter 32 about the seed and growing the tree. Here's the end result of growing the tree of life. He says, and because of your diligence and your faith and your patience, and all of those things apply to section 58 and 59, building Zion, working the land, because of your diligence and your faith and your patience with the word and nourishing it, that it may take root in you, behold, by and by ye shall pluck the fruit thereof, which is most precious, which is sweet above all that is sweet, white above all that is white and pure above all that is pure. And ye shall feast upon this fruit, even until you are filled, that you hunger not, neither shall ye thirst. 
That's the spirit of section 59. If you keep the Lord's commandments, specifically in section 59, if you are grateful for the things that God does and gives you, and if you keep the Sabbath day holy, that fruit will be yours. The best that this earth has to offer, both temporally and spiritually, will be yours. And you will f- eat that fruit and be filled. So come build Zion. Do what you can do. Be anxiously engaged in a good cause. Build Zion. And the good things that God intends to ha- give us will be ours. And it will be a feast inside of us. Just beautiful sections here. And with that, we thank you. Thanks for joining us. And we will see you next time when we cover section... 60 through 62. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.